Greetings, Mavuno family. It's such a joy to be bringing God's word to you today. And uh, so grateful for this month of January that I've been able to preach not just to our online community, but to all the different uh, Mavuno campuses worldwide. And just a big shout out to the campus pastors who host this video in their various campuses and who lead the different Mavuno families. Uh, and all the people who are leading the different watch parties that are across the world. I'm so grateful for every one of you. I'm also very grateful for the amazing month that January has been. Uh, today we end our 21-day liquid fast. Come on, come on, come on. And as you look around the church, you can see the January bodies. Come on. I mean, everyone's looking really amazing. <laughs> but what an adventure this has been and what a great, amazing thing that God has done. By show of hands, how many for whom it was your first time ever to do a 21-day liquid fast? Let me just see. Show of hands. First day ever. Wow. You made it. Come on. Uh, look, come on, we're so excited that you made it. We're so excited that you did it. And I just want to say, uh, let's come on, let's give a big shout to the Lord. This was amazing. Praise Jesus. Uh, what an amazing God we serve. He's looked after us. We've been able to pray. And I'm so happy uh, for everything that he's blessed us with as we've walked this journey. Uh, many of you, by the way, addictions have been broken uh, in Jesus' name. Many of you, your health has even been reset. Uh, and I want to tell you the words Jesus said. This is a word that I really sense for somebody. Go and sin no more. Some of that food, you'll be those chips you're eating that you stopped eating. That's why your body is feeling so good. Don't go back to the thing that destroyed you in the first place. Let's live a healthy lifestyle going forward. I believe that God intends for health in our bodies as a community this year. And God willing, by the way, we're going to have another seven day fast in May and another one in September because it's our prayer and fasting rhythm. That's one of the rhythms that we start the year with. Another rhythm we start the year with is we read the Bible through. And uh, for those of you who haven't started yet reading the Bible through, I just want to remind you it's not too late. We're reading the New Testament through the year. If you go on our website, you'll actually find information uh, to help you so that you can join us. Just start where we are. You don't have to catch up with everything we've read so far. You can always catch up with the general reading later, but you can even start with today's reading and let's just read the New Testament in the year. And then finally, we have one more rhythm, our third general rhythm, which is the giving of our first fruits. And today is the, the, the end of January. Uh, for those of you who uh, know about the fast fruits, uh, every month we give 10% of our income as our tithes. Uh, this is how we support the ministry of God's house. But in January, we actually do a sacrificial giving and we give 100% of our income. It's called, we call it our first fruits. And it's our step of radical generosity. It's our step of trusting God. It's a crazy faith, I know. But this is one of the ways that God wants us to just grow in knowing Him uh, in our faith. And thank you for all of you who've been able to give that. Uh, we use that for all our capital expansion. We buy land for churches. Uh, we expand God's kingdom and give opportunities for many to hear the gospel through this. And I just want to bless God for every one of you who's pledged. Many of you have even begun to give. Some of you have even given it all uh, by this time. And I'm so excited about that. If you haven't already pledged to us, your first fruits, towards giving your first fruits, then go to our website www.mavunochurch.org and you'll find a link there and you can follow that. It'll give you exact instructions about how to do that. Now we've been going through a series and it's called Unshakable. And the world around us we've seen is going through many storms. And as we go into the future, these storms will only intensify. But God's desire is that his people will be unshakable regardless of the storms that they face. And through this whole month, we've been learning from one of Israel's greatest leaders named Joshua about how to develop an unshakable faith. How do we develop an unshakable faith? We've learned several principles. First of all, by understanding that all the battles we face are spiritual and spiritual battles cannot be won with physical weapons. Then secondly, by understanding who our true leader is. When God's business is your business, then your business becomes God's business. Come on, somebody. I don't know. It just sounds like somebody should write a rap song about that. And then thirdly, we must be men and women of faith. Faith is doing God's will, God's way. Uh, we've been learning about all these things and these are life principles. So if any of you have missed them, you can go online uh, to our Mavuno Movement YouTube page uh, or you can actually search for Pastor M's uh, podcast on Spotify and you'll be able to catch up with us and find out. I mean, let's, let's, let's grow together as we enter into 2024. Now, I hope you know that God is committed to you being victorious in 2024. Let me say that again. I hope you know that God is committed to you being victorious in 2024. Yeah, you better know this. God wants you to have an unshakable faith. And what we saw last week is that where you see a battle ahead of you, God sees a victory behind you. God has already declared that you're victorious before 2024 starts. But the question is, if God is so keen for me to succeed, 
How come that has not always been my experience? How come I don't always feel like I'm successful? How come many times many of us struggle and we limp and we barely make it through year after year? I believe that God's word has something to say to us about this today. And I want us to turn to Joshua chapter 7. And the title of my message today is The Enemy Within. The Enemy Within. Let's read Joshua chapter 7. And this is what it says. But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Kami, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth Aven, to the east of Bethel, and told them, Go up and spy the region. So the men went up, and they spied out Ai. When they returned to Joshua, they said, Not all the army will have to go up against Ai. <laughs> Send two or three thousand men to take it, and do not weary the whole army, for only a few people live there. So about 3,000 went up, but they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed about 36 of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted in fear and became like water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down on the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. The elders of Israel did the same, sprinkled dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring us, bring these people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. Pardon your servant, Lord. What can I say now that Israel has been routed by its enemies? The Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about this and they will surround us and wipe out your name from the earth. What then will you do for your own great name? The Lord said to Joshua, stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things they have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand up against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you can destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. Go, con go consecrate the people. Tell them, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the, Lord of, the God of Israel says. There are devoted things among you, Israel. You cannot stand against your enemies until you remove them. In the morning, present yourselves tribe by tribe. The tribe the Lord chooses shall come forward clan by clan. The clan the Lord chooses shall come forward family by family. And the family the Lord chooses shall come forward man by man. And whoever is caught with the devoted thing shall be destroyed by fire along with all that belongs to him. He has violated the covenant of the Lord and has done an outrageous thing in Israel. Early the next morning, Joshua had Israel come forward by tribes and Judah was chosen. Clans of Judah came forward and the Zeharites, Zerahites were chosen. He had the clans of the Zerahites come forward by families and Zimri was chosen. Joshua had his family, Zimri's family, come forward man by man. And Achan, son of Kami, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, the son of the tribe of Judah, was chosen. Then Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and honor him. Tell me what you've done. Don't hide it from me. And Achan replied, it's true. I've sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I've done. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver, and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. They're hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent, and there it was, hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. They took the things from the tent, brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites, and spread them out before the Lord. Then Joshua, together with all the Israelites, took Achan, son of Zerah, the silver, the robe, the gold bar, his sons and his daughters, his cattle, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had to the valley of Acre. Joshua said, why have you brought this trouble to us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then all Israel stoned him, and after that they stoned the rest, they burnt them. Over Achan they piled up a huge pile of rocks, which remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his fierce anger. And therefore that place has been called the Valley of Acre. Acre means trouble. The Valley of Acre ever since. You know, in our previous chapter, Joshua chapter 6, it ended with these words. So the Lord was with Joshua and his fame spread throughout the land. This is after Joshua had, had conquered Jericho. The Lord was with Joshua and his fame spread throughout the land. After a verse like that, 
you would ex expect the next chapter, chapter 7, to start by saying, so Joshua and his people rolled from victory to victory, completely unshakable, right? I mean, that's what you expect. I mean, these guys have seen a great victory. God has guided them and they've done amazing things. I mean, Canaan, I mean, Jericho was the, the chief city of Canaan. It was the strongest with its mighty walls. And if it could fall to them so easily, what else could hope to stand against them? That's what you expect. You expect them to move on from strength to strength, but that's not what you read. Why? Because straight from an impossible victory, Israel stumbled into an impossible defeat. And what happened? This, 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 this army that was celebrating victory, they found themselves rooted by a much weaker enemy. Now, some people don't like hearing stories about defeat. They don't like sermons about defeat, especially at the beginning of the year. This is the time we should be talking about victory, victory, victory. But I want to say this, as we start the year, I believe we must not just dwell on the things that will give us victory, but we must also dwell on the things that could result in our defeat. And that's what I want to talk about today. Now, if you remember in family night this last week, we, 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 talked, we, we saw how God patiently allowed 400 years for the people of Jericho to turn from their active rebellion against God. I mean, 400 years was just God's grace. He was giving them time to change. Eventually, however, the consequences of their rebellion ran out. God's mercy ran out for them. And God had authorized the Israelites to completely destroy everything in Jericho, except one repentant person who was incidentally a prostitute called Rahab and her family. And as a result of Israel being obedient, they won a, a mighty war against a vastly superior enemy. But now, because of sin, they found themselves defeated by a much weaker enemy, an enemy that was so easy for them to, to defeat. And they were terrified. And I believe that our passage is very important for us, very instructive for us, Mavuno, as we enter into 2024, because it tells us several things about sin that I think it's important for us to know. Number one, personal sin will sabotage your purpose. Personal sin will sabotage your purpose. God had commanded the Israelites not to keep any of Jericho's valuables for themselves. I mean, one of the soldiers, his name was Achan. And I just think of Achan as this big guy. He's a soldier like everybody else, like fighting with his brothers. But in the middle of the battle, he, he, he saw something that he liked. And he tells us later in the passage, it's a beautiful robe from Babylonia. I mean, Babylon was like the height of civilization at the time. A beautiful robe from there would have been worth lots and lots of money. And he found 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold waiting, weighing 50 shekels. And somehow as people are fighting, the guy was just, he found a way to hide it somewhere. And then after that, he took it to his tent. And he figured that no one would ever know. But you see, his action was about to create major issues, not just for himself, but for his family and for the entire nation. Now think about it. God's purpose for Achan, because God has a purpose for every one of us. And God's purpose for Achan was that this man would be part of the greatest generation of Israel that would settle the land of Canaan. Like the rest of Israel, God desired that Achan would never lose a battle, that he would live a fruitful life, that he would help establish a new nation, that he would sit at the fireplace when he's older with his children and tell them stories about God's goodness. This was God's plan for his life. But here's the thing that he, like many of us, did not know. That as much as God has assured me victory as his son or daughter, the only person who has power to sabotage that victory is myself. Listen, the devil cannot sabotage your victory. Uh-uh. Not, not, not unless God allows it and God won't allow it. The only person who will allow your victory to be sabotaged is who? Yeah. I'm the only person who can sabotage my victory. And that's the biggest lesson I believe we can learn from this passage. That the greatest enemy of your victory is the enemy within. It's not the enemy without. It's not other things or circumstances. It is me. I am the greatest enemy of my victory. And to understand this, we need to understand the nature of sin. Sin is not just doing something annoying that God doesn't like. You know, like a, like a small child caught eating sugar and then pretending he didn't do it. It's not an annoying thing. Sin is much graver. In the Bible, the word sin, whether you read it in the Hebrew or in the Greek language, it, stands, it, it means one thing. It means to miss the mark. To miss the mark. And what it implies is that there's a mark. There's a way that God wants us to live. That God has a will for our lives. And when we choose to intentionally disregard God's will and do it our way, then we sin. We, we, we go our way and we sin. 
we know what we're supposed to do and we do something else instead. That is sin. That is actually rebellion against God. It's not even about following a list of rules because sometimes people think a sin. Like, what did I do that disregarded the rules? It's not about the rules. In Romans chapter 1, verse 20, the apostle Paul says something profound. He says, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. In other words, God has put an awareness of himself deep in every human heart regardless of their culture. He's put an awareness of his ways, of what is fair, of what is right, of what is just, the difference between right and wrong. But as a human beings, our tendency is to lean away from what is right and to lean towards what works for me, towards selfishness. And that's where our sin comes from. The problem with sin is that it effectively removes us away from God's cover and protection. That's exactly what we see in this story of Israel. God is the source of our life. And when we move away from life, what are we choosing? We're choosing death, the opposite of life. And that's why Paul wrote in Romans chapter 6, verse 26, for the wages of sin is death. That that's, when, when you sin, you're working for death. That's what, you're pay, that's, that's what the wages of sin is. It's like, it's like what is rightfully coming to you is death. Sin destroys your purpose. Achan would never live to, live, to, to see the purpose that God had created him for. And ultimately, sin destroys our lives. The wages of sin is death. And the greatest enemy of your victory, you need to remember, is the enemy within. So in this passage, by the way, as you think about that, it's not just Achan who sins. Because Joshua, the leader of Israel, he also rebels against God. How I, why do I say this? He sends out spies, just like he did for, for Jericho, to check out the city of Ai. I mean, he does the whole standard procedure but this time round, even on getting their report, we don't get any indication that they pray. We don't get any indication that they even ask God what he thinks. I mean, he felt like I can, we can do this one. I mean, Jericho, we needed your help, God. But this one, we got this. And it's like, how many times do we do the same thing? I mean, I confess many times that my own actions could be like that. It's like, yep, God, I've got this one. I could pray about this other big one. But this one, what's the big deal? Remember back in the day, for those of you who grew up in Kenya, when the roads were really bad, and you'd go traveling up country. Even if your up country was like two hours away, like, like mine is, uh, you, you would, like I remember my parents would all stand there and hold hands and pray around that car. It's like, protect us on these roads, Lord. And then they made highways. And now it's like, I'm just getting in the car and I'm going there. You don't even think about praying. It's like, God, I've got this. It's like, as human beings, we, 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 we just have a way of pushing God to the sidelines when we think we're in control. Anybody feeling me on this one? And, and the results for Joshua, and Israel were deadly. Because I believe had they prayed, God would have told them, hold on a minute. Before we go forward, there's a problem in the camp. And people would not have had to die. You see, we tend to rush headlong into life. And then we expect God to make things right once we make a mess of it. It's so much better when we consult God for wisdom before we make the mess. Personal sin will sabotage our purpose. Tell your neighbor, personal sin can sabotage your purpose. But then number two, as if that is not enough, personal sin has communal consequences. Personal sin has communal consequences. When Achan succumbed to temptation and he hid the valuables in his tent, he probably thought this is a small thing. No one will ever notice. It's a victimless crime. <laughs> Little did he know that this thing would result not just in his own death, but the death of 36 of his military brothers. If anybody who serves in the army will tell you, when you, those people you fight with are your brothers. 36 of them are about to die. 36 primary breadwinners for their families. 36 women are about to be rendered widows for life. 36 sets of children are about to grow up without a father the rest of their lives and the implications that will have on the generations in their families. But for Achan, it would even be worse because his own wife and children would die because of his actions. Now, Achan's story... It's a testimony to us about the seriousness of sin. Not just the seriousness in our own lives, but in the lives of those around us. It teaches us that when we rebel against God, sin doesn't just affect us, it affects the people around us. My sin has an effect on my marriage. My sin has an effect on my kids. My sin has an effect on my business or my career. My sin has an effect on my ministry. My sin has an effect on the people around me. That's just the way it is. I wish it wasn't like that. 
I really wish it wasn't. I wish God had structured this world so that only the person who sins is impacted by their sin. But you know, think about it. The same thing happens in the physical world. It's like, if I choose to drive my car today on the highway and I'm drunk and I cause an accident, it may be me who was drunk and maybe the people who I hit were even going to church to pray. <laughs> but the consequences will be on the people that I collided with just as much as on myself. And, and how many people have grieved and have been bereaved by some random person who was a sinner? You are innocently doing your own thing or your person was innocently doing their own thing and somebody else's sin hurt them. Oh, here's another one. Uh, maybe I'll talk about one that many people might think of as a victimless crime. Maybe I'm thinking that watching porn will harm no one. I mean, I'm just in front of my computer. I shut it down. Nobody ever gets to see it. I mean, it's just about me. It's my choice. It's my life. It's nobody else. But here's the thing I want you to understand. That action, it's fueling the global trade in human trafficking. Because all the young girls who are people's daughters, by the way, and your daughter, you're going to have a daughter one day, God willing. You need to understand that their daughters being kidnapped all across the world today and traded and forced to act in those pornographic videos and to enter into sex, sex trade because of the global porno, the demand for pornography that people like you and me might be putting on that. So you, you're understanding, it's not a victimless crime. And leave alone the people out there as well because it's going to harm other people. But on a personal front, it will harm the person you marry because it will have a negative influence on your intimacy. Let me tell you, this has been proven beyond a doubt. It's not even something for debate. It will destroy, it will harm your marriage considerably. But by harming your future marriage, you're also harming your future children because chances are they will grow up without re uh, relating to their own spouse the, way, the same way they saw their parent relating to, uh, the way they saw you relating to your spouse. So you not only have you sabotaged your marriage, you've sabotaged generations of marriages in your family. You've introduced a generational stronghold in your family. That, are you seeing the soberness of this thing? Some of our families today, we're still struggling with patterns that are the result of the sins of ancestors, earlier generations. We know families where alcoholism is normal. It's almost thought of as genetic in those families. I, I know one family where five out of six sons have died from alcohol-related issues in the last 10 years. I mean, it's insane. <laughs> I mean, it's like, that's not normal. Uh, maybe there are people also who, who here whose families have struggled with uncontrolled rage. And almost seems like this is just a thing. Us guys, we're just like this. We're just angry people. And you've seen anger and outbursts and fighting and violence. Or men in this family never amount to much. You'll hear people say that. It's like all the men just never get good jobs, even though they have all the potential to get that. Or women in this family have always married out of wedlock. And they never have good weddings. I mean, listen, these things are not normal. This are the consequences, communal consequences of the sins of an earlier generation. And that's why we took so much time in the first week of our prayers, our fasting and prayer to break generational bondages in our families because there are some things that come to you and yet you're not the one who caused them. Can you see it? Whether it's corruption in my business, whether it's uncontrolled anger, whether it's greed, whether it's cheating on my spouse, whether it's my addictions or whether it's telling lies, there is no such thing as a victimless sin. My little hidden actions will have the power to harm and destroy generations. So I want you never to forget this, that the greatest enemy of your victory is the enemy within. God has assured you of victory. God has promised you victory. God has worked out his victory. But the greatest enemy of that victory is the enemy within. And so son of God, daughter of God, I pray that you will see and that you can see how dangerous sin is and how rebellion, dangerous our rebellion against God can be. It's not just our lives at stake. It's the lives of those we love. It's the lives of those we would never want to see harmed. It's the lives of those God has put around us. And the higher we are in leadership, the greater the impact of our sin. I mean, Achan, because of Achan's sin, his whole family was destroyed. But because of Joshua's sin, the entire nation was defeated. Are you seeing that? The level of responsibility causes many more people to be harmed. The greatest enemy of your victory is the enemy within. Come on, tell your neighbor that. The greatest enemy, let's say it together, the greatest enemy of your victory is the enemy within. I want everybody in this church to just resound. I want that to resound for us because we need to understand that personal sin will sabotage our purpose. It will have communal consequences. It will stop the victory that God has promised us. But here's number three, and it is this. The, next, the, 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 the last thing we learn about sin, uh, the next thing we learn about sin from this passage. Personal sin must be dealt with. 
personal sin must be dealt with. You know, as we've seen, our choices can sabotage God's purpose for us and grievously harm those we lead. But fortunately, and here's the good news, our God is super gracious. God is so gracious. He always gives us a second chance. He always gives us another opportunity when we confess and turn away from our sin. How do we know this? Because verse 6 tells us what happened. Joshua realized his mistake. What does he do? Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. And the elders of Israel, they did the same. They sprinkled dust on their heads. These people are like, Lord, help us. Joshua and the rest of the national leaders, they humbled themselves before God. They cried out to God for help and God answered. God is a gracious God. And he not only graciously revealed to them what the problem was and what they must do to resolve it. The next chapter in Joshua chapter 8, if you, if, you, if you skip there, you're going to find that God gave them a new strategy and they used it to win the war against Ai. You know, our Heavenly Father is a God of second chances. He didn't hold their sin against them. But when they came in humility and confession before him, he was willing to give them a second chance. But this was not the case of, of, with Achan. Achan was not willing to admit his sin. I noticed a very curious thing. I don't know if you noticed. There's a whole thing. That passage is very long because of this whole thing. Because even though God knew exactly what was causing the problem, he didn't tell it to Joshua. Do you notice what God did? He gave him a long roundabout way of discovering who had done this thing. So the first thing was announced to everybody that tomorrow we're going to find out the criminal. <laughs> so everybody goes to sleep knowing tomorrow we're going to find out what the problem is. And, and, and there's all that time. It's like a whole night. And then the next morning, they start with the tribes. They divide all the tribes and one tribe is chosen. I mean, it's thousands of people. That's a lot of logistics. And then after that, that, that tribe is brought to the center. And then there they divide the clans and one clan. It's like a whole process. Why was God allowing Israel to go through this whole process? I believe it's a very clear indicator of God's mercy that God was giving Achan the opportunity to put up his hand and say, I'm sorry, it's me who did it. I'm the one. I confess. I'm the one who made the mess. But through the process, what does Achan do? He keeps his lips tightly shut, hoping until the very last minute that he would not be discovered. He would not be caught. And only when he was find, found out did he finally admit what he had done. You know, Years later, King Solomon would write in Proverbs 28, verse 13, whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. The way to deal with sin so it doesn't sabotage our purpose and destroy those we love is not to pretend that nothing happened. God's people, that's not the way we deal with it. It's not by moving on like nothing, hoping that no one ever finds out. The Bible says when we confess our sin, that, he, that we receive forgiveness. We receive mercy. When we confess sin, we're telling God what he already knows, by the way. We're not telling God something like God is going to be like, oh, you did what? <laughs> it's not like God is shocked. He already knows what it is. But he knows that it's impossible for us in our own power to live a sinless life. He already knows you're a sinner. He already knows you'll mess up. So he's made a way out for us, knowing that we will sin. And that way is a way of confession and repentance. When we humbly and sincerely confess our sins to God, God is able to intervene and to help us. When we repent, which means when we choose to turn away from our sins, then God gives us the ability to change. I really believe, and here is a shocking thing, I've never thought about this until I read this passage for this, this message. If Achan had confessed and repented from his sin, in that whole time God had been giving him, if Achan had actually confessed and repented, I sincerely believe he would have been saved and his family would have been saved as well. Because 1 John 1, 9 tells us when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. You see, sin pulls us away from God. God is the source of all life. But confession and repentance allows us to receive the gift of God's mercy. And that's why I like Romans chapter 6, verse 23. I know I read the first part, the wages of sin is death. But the second part reads, the entire verse reads, the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Oh my goodness. Yes, sin earns me death. But the gift of God is mercy. The gift of God is eternal life. When I cry out and I confess, ah, you know what? I receive the mercy of God. God, because of his love for us, came to earth in human form to deal with my sin problem. God already knew I couldn't deal with it. So he dealt with it for me. He took my punishment as his by taking the death on the cross to deal with the consequences of my sin. And God wants me to have that life, that eternal life. He wants me to be victorious. He's already won the victory for me. 
He wants me to be unshakable, somebody. He wants us to be unshakable. But you must deal with the enemy within. You must confess it. You must renounce it. You must take on that mercy because the greatest enemy of your victory is the enemy within. Now, I believe today there are some who are watching this who need to give your life to Jesus. As you've listened to this message, you've been convicted that, hey, I, I, I'm, I'm actually in rebellion against my Creator. I'm actually living my own life. And as you've listened to this message, you know, you're, you're, you're saying, Pastor, pray for me. I want to give my life to Jesus. If you're here, I would love to lead you in a prayer. Even as I pray for everybody else, before I pray for everybody else in response to this message, I would love to pray for you. So I'm going to invite us all to just bow our heads for a minute. And if this is you, I'm going to ask you to just pray this prayer after me. And all of those of you who've prayed this prayer before, if you would just say it as well, just to affirm your own salvation. Dear Jesus, I come to you today to ask you to forgive my sin. I confess that I'm a sinner in need of your salvation. And I invite you now to come and to forgive my sin as you have promised in your word. Fill me with your Holy Spirit that I will be a child of God. From today, I am truly yours and I will follow you as you help me. And now I just renounce the enemy and all his works. I pray that, Father, you would have mercy on me and on my family and that you will break all the strongholds that would have come upon us because of my sinful actions. Help us to walk in freedom, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you have prayed that prayer, I'm so proud of you. I love the fact that our God is a God of a second chance. Uh, and I believe he says that uh, when you pray a prayer like that and you believe in your heart that uh, Jesus is Lord and that you believe that God raised him from the dead, that you are saved. And so I want to just welcome you to the family and say that, li listen, God is saying that he will help you to walk in this way. So allow me to just pray for the rest of us now as we conclude our service. Father, I thank you for your goodness, for your mercy for us. I thank you that, Lord, right now there are those who have, had, uh, have, have been convicted because they have been living in sin. And some of you, by the way, whatever your sin uh, area is, the Lord is convict, has convicted you about it. Whether it's in your family, whether it's in your sex life, whether it's in your finances, whether it's in your career, your business, uh, just bring it to the Lord. And I'm in inviting you this week that you would just turn that area over to the Lord in confession. Father, I thank you that you say if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sin and purify us from all unrighteousness. And Father, I just pray over your people that right now you would break every stronghold of sin, any habitual sin, that you would break that stronghold in your people, that as we confess it to you, and Lord, even as we confess it to those around us who we trust, who can help us walk in accountability in our discipleship groups, that Father God, you'd help us to walk a victorious life, uh, a victorious life in 2024. Father, I also want to pray for somebody here who's a victim of someone else's sin. Uh, some of you, maybe you've just been uh, in a place where you've either been bereaved or you've gone through illness or different things because of someone else's sin that had nothing to do with you. And maybe you've been in that place of just difficulty because of that. But Father, I want to thank you because you're the God who breaks every chain. There's power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. And so I pray that Father God, today you would break the chains of generational strongholds among your people. And I pray that, Lord, you would teach us how to pray. You'd show us how to pray this year. Lord, you've said you train our hands for war and our fingers for battle. Train us, Lord, that Father God will be able to walk in freedom and also to win freedom for many others who are in bondage. And Father God, I also want to just pray for our community this year. I pray that, Father God, you'd help us to walk in community and accountability in our discipleship groups. Uh, that, Lord, we would help hold each other up. That none of us would walk the way of rebellion or sinfulness that would uh, destroy our purpose and harm those around us. And so we thank you, Lord. Keep us from sin. Help us to run away from it. Help us not to try and hide it or gloss over it like Achan did, thinking that no one will ever know. Help us to hate sin, Lord, and to love you with a passion. Lord, this is our prayer for ourselves, that we will not harm ourselves or those around us. Lord, we love you. We bless you. We thank you that you're here. We thank you that you've heard us, even as we bring this prayer before you. And I pray that, Lord, even as we move into the next month of the year, as we have come through January, that, Father God, it will be full of thanksgiving, full of victory, full of grace. I pray that your people would walk unshakable 
live unshakable lives this year because Lord, they've encountered that God who helps us to stand, stand firm. And so I bless you God's people in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And God's people say it together, Amen. Amen, amen and Amen.